All right, it's 515. Um, I'll call the meeting to order. Uh, welcome everybody. I'm Monroe Labuis and I'm the chair of the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Commission. Um, let's, let's do a roll call and uh, establish our quorum. Uh, Vice Chair Huber Levy, you wanna take that? Sure. Um, Chairman Labuis. Present. And I am present. Paul Bocanegra. Present. Wesley Liu. Present. Amea Nori. Present. Satvik Nori. Present. Um, Chairman Rasmussen. Oh, Chair. <laughs> Commissioner <Yeah>. Rasmussen. <laughs> I just promoted you. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Swope. Here. And so uh, Roxana Enriquez, Commissioner Enriquez, not here. I don't see her yet. Commissioner Flores. Oh no, Commissioner Enriquez just signed in. Present. And Commissioner Flores. Yeah, I don't see her. Commissioner Wilson, we think she's traveling. And I think that's that's it for our current commissioner slate. Okay, great. So we have uh, more than six and um, that gives us a quorum. Um, so let us uh, carry on. Uh, Susan, you. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Move, uh, Commissioner Wilson just signed on. Oh, great. Okay. I move that because of COVID that we continue to meet remotely per AB 361. I second sure. that motion. Great. Any debate on that point amongst commissioners? All right, hearing none, uh, let's let's have a quick voice vote in for that motion. Uh, commissioners, make sure you come off mute and um, all in favor say aye. 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 Great, any objections or abstentions? All right, the motion passes and per AB 361, we will continue this meeting on Zoom, meeting remotely. Uh, later in the um, on the agenda, if it's approved, uh, we do have uh, an item to talk about meetings in the future, uh, potentially meeting in person. And um, I think the next item on the agenda, we're in uh, item uh, Roman number one, preliminary business. Um, I'll just give a very quick recap uh, of the commissioner offsite that we held on August 20th. And, um, and really, I just wanted to say that uh, the commissioners all got together in person in Redwood City um, at a community center there. And um, we uh, met together most of the day, uh, which was fantastic uh, to actually all get together in person, not be on Zoom and have more time to, um, to discuss matters. And really what we focused the retreat on, uh, in addition to some of us just getting to know each other because we haven't actually met in person, was just talking about how the commission operates, um, how we can be most effective, uh, you know, what methods can we use to, um, to try to get done what our mission and aspirations say we wanna get done. So, um, it, that's that's the basic uh, overview of what we discussed. There will be minutes published. Uh, we did have a couple of members of the public there, and um, it was an agendized meeting. Um, we're just getting notes pulled together, and and at our next meeting, we should have minutes uh, for that offsite. So that's. Uh, that is the quick recap of uh, our offsite from August 20th. So moving on to approving uh, the minutes from our last meeting prior to the offsite, our last uh, Tuesday public meeting of July uh, 2022. Is there a motion to uh, approve the minutes? I would make a motion to approve the minutes uh, subject to a few typos that I noted and would correct. Second. 
Okay. Are those typos worth pointing out? Do they change the substance of it? Uh, um, you, you me? Or if not, it's not, not, I don't think a problem. They, they don't change the substance. Oh, okay. Commissioner Swope has a comment. On page three under 4D, um, I believe the youth outreach program is the probation diversion program, isn't it? Um, Melissa or Melanie? Melanie? Yes, I heard you say Melissa, so I didn't yeah. want <laughs> No, that's okay. Yes, it is. And so CFS provides uh, parenting services and individual and family therapy for YOP clients. And, and I, so we do send, we send referrals to HSA uh, for the YOP program. Mm -hmm. And HSA also utilizes the program as well since it belongs to them. And I think in the next bullet, um, mandatory send to DA would be prior probation violation or terminated diversion. I'm not sure, is that right? Right, so if we, if we do a diversion, um, it, if we put a youth on diversion and they don't complete, like for instance, if they have a six month contract on diversion and they don't complete, then we automatically send that to the DA's office if they come back with a new offense. So it would be that their case is either closed or they're currently on a six month diversion contract, which they don't complete and get a new police referral. Then we send that matter to the DA's office. So I think um, if you put in parens after youth outreach program, uh, probation diversion, and in the next one, prior probation violation, um, terminated diversion. Got it. We'll and do. And I think we're cool. Thank you. Any other changes to the minutes? Okay, uh, Commissioner Hubie Leverett, do we need to amend your motion? No, you, you just you just have to say all those in favor of accepting the minutes as corrected. Okay, uh, all those commissioners in favor of accepting the minutes as corrected, uh, please say aye. 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 Any objections Any or opposed. abstentions? Anyone opposed? Yeah. Those are two different things, Monroe. Oh, okay. Objections are different than abstentions. <laughs> okay, yes, no, I understand that, but I'm calling for both at the same time since there are usually none. Uh, all right, great. The minutes from July, 2022 are uh, approved as amended. And let's move on to our agenda for today, which if members of the public uh, aren't aware on on the juvenile justice website uh, on the probation website um, the, the the agenda and agenda packet <clears throat> and accompanying materials are, are posted uh, so commissioners let's um, let's approve the agenda or if anyone I would like to make any changes thank you is there a second second great any discussion about the agenda, commissioners? Anything you would like to change or move around? Okay, great. Uh, hearing none, uh, all in favor of approving the agenda, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? <laughs> Any abstentions? All right, the uh, agenda is approved. So let's move on to item two of the agenda, which is uh, oral communications, or um, this is public comment. This is an opportunity for, uh, if there are any members of the public that would like to bring uh, something to the attention of the commission that is not already on the agenda, uh, now is the time uh, to, make public comment. And uh, I would just ask if you would like to make public comment that you raise your digital hand uh, using the raise hand feature in Zoom under reactions. Are there any comments, public comments?
Okay, I don't see any. Um, and, uh, and we did not receive any uh, prior to the meeting uh, over emails uh, either. So we will move on then to item three on the agenda. Uh, and item three is when we hear from our partners in the county um, about any updates or trends in the juvenile justice system. Um, and I'll start by uh, recognizing uh, Judge Susan Atizadi. Welcome, Judge Atizadi. Um, I think I did get an email from Judge Cadet prior to the meeting saying that maybe there were no changes or no update, but uh, since I see you there, uh, if you'd like, if you'd like to address us or have any updates, please go sure. ahead. Good evening, everybody. It's really nice to see everybody. It's nice to see Paul and uh, Johanna, and I specifically named them because they visited me in court not too long ago, and we went back in chambers and we had a nice time. So it's nice to see you both. Um, well, today about 145, our court changed the mask mandate. Now it's, in, it's up to individual judges if they want to require masks in their courtroom. So that happened about 145 today. I don't require them in my courtroom um, unless, of course, everybody can wear them. You can wear them if you wish, but I'm not requiring them in my courtroom unless you come into court with symptoms and you tell me they're allergies. And I'm not so sure about that. We might give you a mask and ask you to wear it. But um, that's a that's a big change. You know, we've had this sixth surge and now the numbers are down in the county. So we're back to not wearing masks in my courtroom. I didn't have a chance to check with Judge Cadet because she was on the bench. I was on the bench and I rushed home to get to the meeting. So I don't know what her policy is going to be, but I just thought I would share that with everybody. So, you know, who knows whether we're going to have a seventh surge in the near future or not, but at least for now, I won't be wearing a mask in the courtroom. So I want everybody to know that. Great. Thank you, Judge Adizadi. You're um, welcome. My pleasure. Any, uh, any questions from commissioners? <clears throat> no. Okay, great. Then we will move on to uh, 3A, actually, which is um, an update from probation. And, uh, and as usual, starting with Ms. Stauffer. Good evening, everyone. It's nice to see all of you. So the way that I'm reporting out our information this evening is going to be similar to the way that I have in the past. Going forward, starting next month, it might be a little bit different because we have now, as of uh, July, merged, I'm sorry, August 1st, merged our uh, caseloads. And so what that means is, and I think I briefly mentioned it at the last meeting, is that a PO will be assigned a case and then they're going to hold on to that case and work with that family through the life of the case. Um, so the way that we uh, maintain our stats might change internally a little bit, but I'll still get you all of the same information. So starting with the Assessment Center Investigations Unit for the month of uh, July, we had 177 cases. So from a year ago, it's essentially um, doubled in terms of the referrals that we've received in that unit. Um, the cases that we received for August that were assigned for um, diversion, we had 18 cases for to be assessed with a clinician from BHRS, and that was to either put a youth on a contract 90 days or six months, or to refer them to the Victim Impact Awareness Program or Petty Theft Program or uh, provide a letter of reprimand. We had 38 cases that went to the DA's office. So those were cases that we could not divert. And um, six cases that were assigned specifically for diversion that didn't need to be assessed. So they weren't considered high risk cases. Um, and that would have been, again, for victim impact awareness, petty theft, or a letter of reprimand. Currently, we have four youth on a 90-day contract and four youth on a six-month contract. And we usually have a high success rate with our contracts, um, especially because uh, Erica from HSA and Jose, uh, Erica Esquivel and Jose Cortez work really closely with our families. And we have uh, 16 probation officers, 10 youth who have gang conditions, one youth who is at DJJ, and five youth who are receiving 
non-minor non-minor um, dependent services, so extended foster care services. And then broken down by race, the youth that we serve, we have 59% uh, are Hispanic or Latino, 13% white, 12% black or African American, 6% um, other race ethnicity, which I always find kind of interesting that we have that category. 5% um, are native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, 4% are Asian, and we have 1% that's unknown. Uh, I have a new data point to report out to you. 80% of the youth that we are working with are male, 20% are female. I think you had asked, one of you had asked for us to provide that at the last meeting. So that's what I have. I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Melanie, for that information. And supervised probation, did you give that number? The oh, thank number? you. Thank you, Karen. Um, 124 youth. Okay, thank you. Yes, are on supervised probation. And then that again includes youth who are on six months of court-ordered informal probation and, um, and formal probation. And the EMP stats? Yes, and uh, Jahan will report out we'll on do the those. Stats. Okay. Yes, thank Great. you. Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Stauff or from commissioners? Just one question. Uh, out of the 124 youth on probation, um, is that breakdown 59%? Could we uh, latch that on to that? Or is there a different percentage? So the are, are you talking about for um, our Hispanic Latino families? The 59% yes. applies to all of the youth that we serve. And that includes the 177 that are in diversion um, and then 124 that have already gone through the court process. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. All right, any other questions from commissioners? All right, great, thank you, Ms. Stauffer. And, um, and uh, I think I saw Ms. Clark, superintendent of the YSC, who, uh, go ahead and uh, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, good evening, everybody. So for institutions, we currently have 13 youth that are on electronic monitoring program. Um, we have a total of 17 youth in custody, 16 males, one female, um, and three that are at our girls camp, two are from our county, one from out of county. Um, and then the racial breakdown is 82% um, Hispanic Latino, 11% um, other, and then 7% Native Pacific Islander. Um, we resumed that school. Um, I think last week was the, was the first week and next week after the holiday, we will start our key success um, and our project change through CSM. And one of the big changes for COVID is we, medical, I just got direction that they've changed the quarantine period. So before we had quarantine within the first 72 hours, the first test and then day 12, um, and now if there's no symptoms, it's now five days. So huge, a huge change. So we're making strides, but everything else um, still remains the same for now. That's all that I have. You guys have any questions? I do. Um, what what programming is coming in, into unit like it, at this point? Um, I think pretty much all programs that you know, we're pre-COVID or, or have come back. So okay. that's why our arts unity movement. Um, I'm not sure if I think AANA still kind of hit or miss a little bit. Um, our religious services, um, success centers, um, brighter day, which is our job readiness. And um, the what is it? The writing program. The beat within. Yeah, thank you. Like the beat within. Um, they're they're still coming. 
So I happen to have a meeting with a beep within founder a couple of days ago, actually, who oh, okay. reached out to uh, introduce himself. He was telling me it comes in every Wednesday evening. <laughs> That's all I could think off the top of my head. I might be missing some, but those are what I could think of right now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Any um, other questions for Ms. Clark? Just one question. How you doing, Ms. Clark? Good evening. Um, was there a, a follow-up on that policy that was under review regarding uh, immigration status, possible deportation for our youth? So I know we don't do that. So I don't know if there's anything bigger I just know if we have like a policy I know we we don't do that okay thank you I just saw Susan your um question about Catholic services yes I think that's up to I think the archdiocese and when you guys feel comfortable with resuming I know for Christian services they've been coming for months now so um yeah if, if they're ready to come in they're they're able to Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Clark. All right. Um, the next item that we have on the agenda is a uh, report from Children and Family Services from uh, Director John Fong, who, there he is. Hi, John. Um, you have the floor, go ahead. We'd love to hear from you and for uh, commissioners should know this, but anyone else, um, uh, Mr. Funk did provide a one page or a report that's that is also in the agenda packet. So there's a, a wealth of information there. But John, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Monroe. And hi, everybody. Nice to see everyone. Um, so in the interest of time and given that the uh, data that we provide on a monthly basis is in the agenda and provided prior to been asked just to point out some uh, key changes to the data from July to, to, to August. So we have 140 young people in care currently. That's just an increase of, of two from, from, a, uh, from July to August. Uh, 43 of those 140 are non-minor uh, dependents. In terms of our out of county placement rate, um, that has decreased uh, by about 3% down to 32% out of county. Uh, so we're moving in the right direction there. Uh, relative placement, um, as I've mentioned before, really trying to uh, improve and, and uh, emphasize placement with, with relatives uh, of the young people who are in our care. Uh, that has increased by 2%, up to 34%. Uh, and we have a minor reduction in our STRTP, uh, young people who are placed in STRTP level of care uh, from five young people to four uh, young people. Uh, happy to answer any other questions that you might have uh, regarding any of the data provided in, in the in the packet. Yeah. Also, some good news: we 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 have fourteen new social workers coming on board. So, um, thank you. Good news. That's yeah. great. Um, sorry, hey Paul, just uh, just real quick, uh, John. Fourteen is takes it up to a total of what? The addition of fourteen. Uh, well, I know that that takes us to a, about a 13% vacancy rate. Uh, so I'd be guessing with the exact number, Monroe, so I'd hate to say that uh, on record currently, but I can certainly get that back to you. Okay, cool. Yeah. Sorry, Paul. Go ahead. That's fine. Thank you. Um, I just want a, a question on that 2% down, and that's great news. Any youth that we can keep in their natural communities is extremely important and treatment-based uh, for the youth, evidence-based as well. What have we done as a county differently that has uh, triggered this 2% drop here and out of county placement? And is there any discussion for maybe creating some space for foster youth within our county? Thank you, John. Yeah, you know, I think it's, it's an ongoing, um... I guess an ongoing focus that we need to revisit um, day in, day out. Uh, so it really boils down to you know our, our leadership uh, at the supervisory level. 
uh, ensuring that with every investigation and every separation of a child from a home, that the first question we ask is, do you have any relatives? And that sounds simple and basic, uh, but that is the essence of moving the needle to uncover and turn over every stone that we have available to us for potential placement, to identify natural supports to the family uh, for a placement in those emergency situations. Uh, so I don't know that there's a, you know, a science to it when it comes to relative placement, it really has to do with the level of inquiry that we participate in uh, with every family that we interact with. Yeah? And that's an ongoing endeavor. Uh, you know, I'm speaking about those who are initially separated from the home, uh, but we conduct family finding efforts throughout the life of the case. Uh, so as you know, um, you know, relatives who initially provide care up front in the, in the, in the continuum uh, perhaps can't do it long term. Uh, or perhaps another relative surfaces throughout the process. Uh, our goal is to, is to uh, identify as many relatives and natural supports as possible for every young person in our care. Uh, in terms of what we are doing uh, for a place for folks to stay in county, we're, we're, we're discussing several uh, different options. Uh, one is uh, we've gone out uh, to solicitation for emergency placement beds in our county. Uh, and what that means is us paying uh, for uh, the beds up front uh, so that they are available uh, in any situation at any time. Uh, as you might imagine, there's not a whole lot of people signing up for that job. Uh, so we have had no success, to be honest. I was gonna say a little success, but no success with two uh, requests for proposal solicitations uh, for those services. So we're gonna up it in terms of a service fee, uh, try again uh, and try to uh, you know, leverage that opportunity as a potential solution. Also in discussions with the state about the option uh, to create a, a, a temporary shelter care facility in our county for uh, 300 dependent youth. We've talked about it here before, uh, AB 403 CCR uh, made a concerted effort um, to move away from anything related to congregate care settings. Shelters uh, were one of those settings. Uh, but since that time, uh, the state has uh, kind of come to the middle and realized that there is a gap in our continuum of services, placement services for our young people, particularly in an emergency placement situation. So there is now, I'm not gonna say an embrace, but an openness uh, to consider uh, what's known as TSCF uh, uh, facilities, temporary shelter care facilities. Uh, so I'm working with my residential team to discuss that option as well, and certainly we'll keep this group up to date should we move forward um, with, that, with that model in our county, which we have had in the past, aka the, the receiving home uh, for those okay. who have been around. Yeah. Mr. Fong, I have a quick question uh, related to 403 and STRTPs. I was just wondering if our uh, four, four STRTP youth, are they in county or are they from out of county? Are they placed in county? Uh, are they from our county? The, the numbers that I'm reporting out are only our San Mateo County dependent youth. Okay. So from our county. And John, and thank you so much. That was uh, a lot of information there that you shared with this commission and as well as the public that I'm sure is uh, wondering, like, what is our foster system up to? What is happening with our county's children? Why are they outside of county lines and why are they missing out on all of the benefits and services that our um, very wealthy and wonderful county has to offer? Um, but one question um, I was wondering. Do you track the data on how many foster youth are received as a result of maybe criminal justice system involvement by the parents? Uh, not specifically, uh, Paul. Uh, what I can tell you is that would gen if there are if there is no other legal guardian or care provider for that young person, uh, and we do file a petition. Um, you know, certainly we can we can dig 
for that information. That's not something that, to my knowledge, I need to talk to my data analysts to see if there's a place where we capture that data specifically. Otherwise, it would be a manual count. Thank you so much, John. Appreciate your help. Mm -hmm. Commissioner John, Spoke, yeah, go ahead. John, um, the receiving home was converted to an STRTP, but from what I can gather from what you've told us, uh, all of the young people who require STRTP care are in Canyon Oaks. Is there any possibility of the um, re old receiving home becoming the new receiving home? Um, it, it's, it's under, it, it would be under consideration, uh, not entirely. Uh, so currently the uh, Elysian STRTP is a 12 bed facility. Um, uh, and um, respectfully, all of our STRTP kids are actually not placed at Canyon Oaks. They're placed throughout and, and in part over at Elysian uh, STRTP. So we have a total of 24 beds in county that's inclusive of Elysian and Canyon Oaks. Now Canyon Oaks offers on-site schooling, uh, obviously, so there's a different level of service that can be provided. Uh, to particular young people at Canyon Oaks. And I think that's the real distinction between the two programs. Um, uh, but there's, there's a, a whole lot on the table, uh, Susan, and uh, we haven't come to any decisions at this point, not quite yet. But again, I, I'd be happy to keep this, this group uh, up to date as, as things develop. And I, I had one more question, John, and then I'm gonna leave you alone. <laughs> Um, no yeah, we have like, do you have a, a, a rough number on, for instance, on incarceration per year on, on, on a youth? I think the numbers are 1.5 million or above that a year. Do we have about how much a budget on about how much we spend on foster children per year? I don't have that offhand, uh, Paul. I couldn't. I couldn't begin to tell you on that number. What I can tell you is that we have nine young people in a dual status right now, meaning they are 300 welfare and institutions codes dependents as well as uh, 602 status uh, on the delinquency side. So, um, you know, I don't have that number specifically for foster youth specifically. Would you, would it be fair to say that those kids are receiving a million dollars a year, those nine children from our county? Uh, I don't know. I don't know that that's the case. I think that would be speculative to be honest. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not absolutely sure, you know, these nine individuals are not incarcerated, so to speak. Uh, they may be on probation status, but not receiving the full scope of juvenile justice services. So uh, I can't say, Paul, uh, again, uh, what the cost of that is for our, uh, our foster youth population. Thank you so much, John. Sure. All right, thank you so much, John, um, for that report and uh, answering those questions. Uh, on the agenda in, uh, in the same section, um, I did put a placeholder in case there were other, uh, other agency or county um, partners who, who had any updates. I didn't receive any ahead of time, but I, I, think, I, I think I see some members of uh, EHRS or the private defender group or, uh, or maybe County Office of Education. Um, and so if there are any of those uh, partners of the commission who sometimes give updates who would like to now, um, go ahead and raise your hand or jump in. Hi, good evening, everyone. Shelly Johnson, principal of Courtin Community Schools. Hi, oh, I see friendly faces. Hi, Melissa. Yep. Hi. Um, uh, in short, um, it's been a great partnership. Um, I really appreciate um, Superintendent Clark um, uh, being flexible with our scheduling uh, due to some low enrollment, but on a real positive benefit. Um, I feel that both Kemp and, Court and Hillcrest School um, have single subject teachers in all areas. Um, we are starting our programming um, inside the schools again in person um, in terms of financial literacy through um, San Mateo Credit Union. So there will be starting in a few weeks. Um, Success Center is also starting over at um, Gateway where there are a couple of students on probation. And so 
they're getting that benefit. And then we're launching our uh, maker space this year where we were able to uh, have our coordinator of innovative learning and technology um, join our team at a point four where she'll be um, supporting all of our teachers in project-based learning for all their content areas. So there'll be at least three projects rolling out in terms of math, science, English, and social studies throughout the year, including Canyon Oaks even. Um, and then I'm really excited as well to be working with Chris Wu and um, Linda Allen with Project Change. We uh, launched developmental psychology this semester, along with Keys to Success, as Superintendent Clark was saying. And then um, this upcoming spring, we anticipate um, launching uh, an ethnic studies class along with a drawing art class. Uh, and then we're very excited to also launch a career class this upcoming summer um, uh, during the students' uh, credit recovery time. So I'm very enthusiastic about the upcoming programs um, to, to offer our students uh, more life um, interaction lesson, lesson and project-based and outward thinking. And um, I look forward to sharing those products as they roll out throughout the year. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson, welcome. Um, Though I have just a quick question. Those last few programs that you mentioned, are those specifically for Hillcrest or, or were you talking about um, those programs being for the youth in, in the YSC? Oh, yes. Thank you for um, asking for that clarity. So yes, all um, both Kemp and Hillcrest, um, we always get things pre-approved as far as our project-based materials, uh, but Superintendent Clark is always graciously working with us to, um, to ensure that our students are getting that, as that important aspect of their education. And so uh, we'll have one pro project per content this semester and then two next semester. Um, so it may not happen this first quarter, but definitely um, some project-based learning opportunities will definitely be distributed and displayed probably by the end of November, early December. Great. Any other questions for Ms. Johnson from commissioners? I have a question. Um, does this also include Gateway School? Yes, it does. Okay, and then how are you guys tracking how many students are, I guess this is maybe a project change question. How are you guys tracking like how many students actually graduate from that program and from the community college? In terms of project change graduates or, or um, high school graduates from the county programs? Both. Both. So we have a student information system. Um, it's now ARIES this year. We have a new student information system where we can pull queries about who graduated what, and then we also have um, our college classes embedded in that for grading window. So we're able to pull queries to show how many students were involved in those classes. And, um, and then also who ended up graduating for our program on the dashboard by the end of the year. So uh, we, we will be able to produce that data, yes. Got it, thank you. You're welcome. All right, any other questions from commissioners for Ms. Johnson, or are there any other uh, of our partners who wanted to give a quick update? We still have a little time on the agenda. I guess I'll ask a question. Okay. Um, um, you were going to be working on integrating the measurements of academic progress into teaching and, um, and your work this last year. What, what, What's happened on that? So great question. Mm -hmm. So uh, twofold. So when we had our WASC six year review, which, uh, oh. which we passed with flying colors, and then we had a six year extension. So our mid cycle review will be in the 24, 25 school year. Huge. So, yes. And so the Huge. reason why, I know, right. It was very, <laughs> so all that being said, um, to answer to the point of your question, their feedback was we quite didn't meet that metric in terms of full picture because our population was so small. So mm -hmm. what they advised us to do uh, was to have smaller data points um, and do individual student studies. And so in response to that, I have cut our, since we're down from 16 action plans in 2006 mm -hmm. to now just to, uh, we went down from 16, now we're down to four. And so in response to that, I was able to cut our PD in half so that we can have team meetings at every site to discuss each individual um, student where we measure their math, as you said, their MyPath, which is an extension from 
um, mm -hmm. map to, um, to address every single content standard in math and reading that they missed. Mm -hmm. So they'll have that um, course uh, printed out upon um, completion if they, when they transition back to district. And then mm -hmm. MAP, because we have more consistent students now for long-term, even though our mm -hmm. population is much smaller, that's a real opportunity for us. So we'll be able to look at that 90-day uh, read on the RIT to mm -hmm. where a student were to earn three points every 90 days. That means they've raised a grade level for every three points. So our mm -hmm. ultimate goal would be at least two grade levels, right? So we're hoping to see um, a six-point up, um, uptake with um, each individual student that's been with us 90 days or longer. And right now, what's the average uptake? Well, we haven't measured it yet. We haven't figured I, it out. Okay. I would say I would say last year, uh, 60%. And so mm -hmm. really, we can do better. So this yeah. year, I'm really hoping to see minimum um, 80%. Okay, that's exciting progress. Yeah, and we try to make it incentive-based so that the students really want to take an, a, a legitimate take in terms of the assessment process, because it is taxing when we get mm -hmm. that. Um, so we try to provide a more upbeat environment for that with snacks and and, and um, incentives as far as some break time and um, game time and things of that nature. And so it's been going really well. We had the most calming um, assessment time at the beginning of the school year. All the students really dialed in. So I was really proud of everybody. Um, so does that answer your question or did you want I think, to more I, I think so. We could nerd out some more, but that was great. Yeah, no problem. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much, Ms. Johnson. Um, <clears throat> we have just a couple of minutes before we get to our next uh, agenda item. And, um, and so since I think commissioners have asked all their questions, uh, I, I wanted to take a few minutes to invite any public comment. Um, if there's any public comment on you know, what we've heard in agenda item three, um, you're welcome to raise your hand using the Zoom feature. So you can do that now if you'd like. Okay, well, seeing none, that's fine. We'll, um, we will move on to our next uh, agenda item. Oh, Commissioner Rasmussen, you look like you're not a member of the public, you are a commissioner, but uh, did you have a question or a comment? Well, I noticed that Ron Reyes was turning his camera on and off. I think he was going to give a report, but I don't see him, so he may have dropped off. I just wanted to bring that to your attention before we moved on. But I don't Thank you. Him. Yeah, I actually did see Ron, um, and for anyone who doesn't know, Ron is uh, uh, runs the private defender office uh, in the county. But I think Ron let me know ahead of time that he didn't really have an update uh, this month. So, um, so thank you, Commissioner Rasmussen. Um, all right, let's move on to uh, item, I think it is item four uh, on our agenda. Um, the, the, we're gonna talk about a proposal for, for, for civilian oversight of the Sheriff's Office in San Mateo County. Uh, there is a draft letter uh, in the agenda packet, um, which we will get to, but first to, um, to give us a presentation on this topic, I wanna recognize uh, Jim Lawrence and Nancy Goodben from um, Fixin' San Mateo County, a, uh, a local nonprofit. Uh, so Jim or Nancy, which one of you wanna take it away? Hi, my name is Jim Lawrence. Whoops. Oh, Jim, we can't, he, something wrong with your mic maybe? We can't hear you very well, or you also have a phone you wanna uh, move closer? I don't know. Can you hear me now? Better, but maybe lean into the mic. Okay, um, I'll get closer to uh, my screen. Thank you for inviting us again. My name is Jim Lawrence. I'm chair of the board of directors for Pinkton San Mateo County. Uh, we are a nonpartisan, nonprofit 501c4 organization. Our mission, simply stated, representing all the residents of San Mateo County, is to convince the Board of Supervisors to install a civilian oversight board and Inspector General's office for our San Mateo County's Sheriff's Office. To that end, we have recommended to the board to use their legislative authority given to them via Assembly Bill 1185, 
to install this oversight board. Now, let me just take a moment to kind of put that into context for you. We live in a democracy. All of our elected leaders have checks and balances. President Biden, Governor Newsom, both have the Congress or Assembly, the Senate, and the Supreme Court. My local police chief, I live in Foster City, Tracy Avalar, as a city manager and city council. However, as a surprise to me, our county sheriff does not have any ongoing checks and balances. He currently reports to an answer to no one. Yes, he's elected every four years, but so is our president and governor. And I'm pleased to report, as you all know, we have a new elected sheriff of San Mateo County. However, with the installation of this oversight board, we, the residents of San Mateo County, will gain transparency into this vital governmental office. Remember, we invest annually $300 million into this organization. Let me repeat that. Taxpayers' money spent by the sheriff's office annually is $300 million. So the net of this is we've been, we need to begin to build community trust of those who have given the right to enforce our laws. Remember, they are sworn to protect and serve in a fair and impartial manner all San Mateo County residents. For your information, 220 cities and counties nationwide and 25 here in California now have civilian oversight boards and an inspector general. Our progress to date, several members have endorsed our campaign, including the highest elected officials in the county, Anna Eshoo, Jackie Spear, Kevin Mullen, the Board of Supervisors, Honorable President Horsley has agreed to form a subcommittee to study this recommendation. Our newly elected sheriff, Christina Corpus, supports our efforts. We're fully aligned. Just recently, at Moon Bay Council voted to endorse us, as well as a couple of other organizations. Hundreds of residents have sound, sh signed up to join us. In summary, what we're seeking is community-wide support. Therefore, we're requesting your support, and your endorsement of our mission. So please join us in representing to the board to use our legislative authority to install a civilian oversight board in the Inspector General's office. Now, I'll turn it over to Nancy Goodman our executive director, who will take you through our slide deck. Like you, we love facts and figures. And Nancy will share ours with you. So thank you, and I'll give you Nancy Goodman. Hi, thank you, Jim. And um, I'm the executive director of Fix in San Mateo County, a volunteer that lives in Redwood City. I'm not actually going to go to the slide deck. Jim was on an airplane when Monroe and I decided to make our presentation really short so you guys would have time to talk. But just to, to follow up on what Jim said, we wanted to thank those of you um, who are already supporters, who are on the commission, for instance, Monroe, Johanna, and Paul. And Paul was the vice chair of Fix and San Mateo County until he um, stepped down a few weeks ago. So thank you to all and also to um, Chelsea Bonini and Ligia Andrade Zunica, who are, who are here tonight and also endorse us along with a lot of other elected officials. We wanted to just call to your attention too, the Behavioral Health Commission wrote a letter to the Board of Supervisors similar to the one that you're considering. And that's when we we're thinking, well, my gosh, behavioral health, Juvenile justice, both of those are the key players with regard to um, oversight of the sheriff, policing practices, and jail practices. And then most recently, um, a couple of days ago, Paul and Jim and Becca, who's here, uh, and, and Trina, who's our outreach person, presented to the North Fair Oaks Council, and they also agreed to send a letter to the Board of Supervisors. So pretty much we're asking you to send a letter saying that you think it, that the Board of Supervisors should use their authority to enact um, strong and independent civilian oversight. And as Jim said, we do have the support in general. We've got a conceptual agreement with the sheriff-elect on this, which is good. And um, also for anyone who is here, we would love to have other commissioners join the three that I mentioned and um, give us your endorsement that we could list your name on the website. 
So that's it for us, Monroe, back to you. Or if there is any questions. Oh, I apologize. I was on mute. Uh, commissioners, what, what questions do you have about the proposal uh, for civilian oversight of the sheriff's office? Um, and right now we're going to limit the questions to, uh, to commissioners um, and then seek some public comment. Uh, Commissioner Swope, I think you had your hand up first. Yeah, I'm, I move that we send a letter supporting uh, civilian oversight of the sheriff's office to the Board of Supervisors. Because you need you need a motion on the floor before you discuss. Uh, <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Commissioner Swope. I believe technically we can ask questions before the motion, but but I defer. I, I since I read Rosenberg's rules of order right before the meeting to be prepared for this. Uh, I believe that is the case. However, I would defer to your experience, wisdom, and experience. Uh, but in, in any case. Fine, let's move forward. With the, uh, there's a motion on the floor. Does anyone second that motion? I'll second that motion. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Huber-Levy. Uh, so further discussion or and or questions for the presenters uh, on this topic? Uh, commissioners, I see, uh, Commissioner Bocanegra, I see your hand up. Yes, thank you so much, Jim, uh, Nancy, and Becca uh, for, for coming out and presenting. To us, I just want to. I'm not sure if you guys. It's a little hard to see, you, Paul. <laughs> okay, so this is Derek Gaines, a 15 year old who was shot and killed uh, in 2015 by San Francisco, South San Francisco PD. I met with his aunt, uh, Justine, Sunday, and I also met his 22 year old, now criminally justice involved cousin who was also 15 and were planning a birthday party um, before he was killed. Um, they have the same birthday. So I, I just wanted to air that through my community work, I just met this young man's uh, family and they were very unhappy with how youth of color are being treated in their community and in this county. And they wanted me to, to bring his name uh, to this commission and put his name out there because they believe that he's been forgotten because he's just one more black kid shot and killed by police uh, here in our county. So uh, I just wanted to mention uh, his name today and also say thank you so much for coming and bringing such an important issue to our commission. I look forward to continuing to support you and just um, thank you. Commissioner Liu, uh, I see your hand up. Hi, yes. Uh, first of all, let me say thank you, Nancy, and thank you, Jim, for all your work on behalf of Fixing San Mateo. Uh, I, I just have one sort of application question, and, and it's about what this oversight board would look like and what its functionality is, uh, when, assuming it's implemented. The board itself will recommend Oh. Jim, we're having trouble hearing you. Jim, we can't hear you. Maybe Nancy can answer the question. I think we're having a yeah. A Let me take a stab at that. Unless Jim can get his microphone working. We are recommending to the Board of Supervisors that the Civilian Oversight Board be 11 members, two from each district plus uh, one at large. By law, under AB 1185, they are to be appointed by the Board of Supervisors as is the chair. And what they'll be looking at um, is our, our recommendation is basically they'll be kind of the eyes and ears for the community. The, um, they will do listening to the community. They will receive input. Um, they will maybe identify trends. Somebody might say, well, it seems like we have a lot of traffic or you know, traffic stops or over policing in our neighborhood. They'll look at that, not, a, not do independent uh, investigations of incidents. That's what the other half does, the inspector general. But they'll more listen to the community. And it's a place where the community does not have right now yet um, opportunity to speak out. So there are things that happen in the community that we hear about, but there's no place to take them, if that helps. Thanks, Nancy. Um, looks like we have one more question from a commissioner and then uh, actually two. Uh, 
And then I'll ask for public comment. Um, Commissioner Wilson, go ahead. So there's no more teeth to the oversight group other than being reporting to the Board of Supervisors. Is that right? Um, yes, that's correct. And the slide deck, we have a common slide deck. I'm happy to drop in the chat. But basically, oversight is not a panacea. It shines mm -hmm. a light and it provides transparency. And then allows, um, in every county that does it, they bring it forward, their recommendations to um, the Board of Supervisors and the Sheriff. And a lot of times they're implemented and successfully make changes. But the Oversight Board and the Inspector General, which is the other half of it, the investigative half, they do not have the power under the state constitution um, and nor there, is there any way to give them the power to make decisions on budget policy or discipline for the sheriff's office. Board of Supervisors okay, is pretty limited in that role as well. They can make budget policy, budget decisions for the Board of Sheriff's Office, but they can't make disciplinary and policy decisions for the Sheriff's Office. Commissioner Nori, go ahead. Hi, uh, sorry, uh, my audio's been cutting out, so I might have missed this part, but I was just curious, do a lot of other counties in, uh, in California have a similar model like we're proposing for San Mateo County? Yeah, we've got LA and San Francisco are some of the big ones at Sonoma, um, Santa Clara, and um, Sacramento. They're all a little bit different. And I'll also share a link to this research paper we did, we call it a white paper that talks about what others are doing. But in general, under the new AB 1185, they're all authorized to have a civilian oversight board with subpoena power, plus an inspector general who's usually a trained attorney with subpoena power. The difference being the civilians are people like um, myself. I, I'm not that I would be on it, but lay people. And the inspector general is someone who's um, trained in investigation, uh, gathering information, collecting, <clears throat> interviewing witnesses, and, and developing a case file. And they Thank all you. pretty much do that, but they're all a little bit different. I'm going to also pop a link. We have a great talk coming up the day after Labor Day at 7 p.m. by Zoom by the guy who does this for uh, Santa Clara County, Mike Janaco, and he's done it with other uh, cities and counties as well. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add one thing that maybe has not come out too clearly, uh, which is that the state legislature did, you know, pass a, a law that gave counties and specifically board of supervisors the authority to create these civilian uh oversight boards and inspector generals so the specifically the the motion on the floor just to clarify for everyone again is to send the letter that is in the agenda packet to the board of supervisors and to recommend to the board of supervisors that they use that authority that's given them by the state legislature to create uh, such a civilian oversight board and inspector general uh, so I'd like now to um, move to, if there are no other, oh, Commissioner Rasmussen, I see that you'd like to ask a question or make a comment. I was going to move to public comment on this item before we call for a vote on the, on the motion. Uh, Commissioner Rasmussen, go ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to make a brief comment. I, I just wanted to clarify that this initiative really isn't an adversarial one. As many of you know, I come from a long a family with a long line in law enforcement, over 100 years serving in, in right here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And good officers um, like things, are supportive of initiatives like that because it brings daylight onto things. So I just wanted to um, mention that many, many uh, law enforcement officers are supportive of this initiative and that it's not necessarily an adversarial one. Thank you. Especially in this county where the sheriff elect ran on transparency and community engagement and wants to do advisory and listening councils. And we've met with her twice to talk about some of the details. And Great. So when, uh, let's move now, since I don't see any other commissioners with questions to uh, public comment uh, on, on the proposal. And I would just ask that maybe you limit your comments to uh, about a minute. We're, we're running out of time on this agenda item uh, and we need to get to a vote on the motion that's on the floor. Um, so Catherine has been very patient with her hand up. Catherine, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, 
we've been in communication with many uh, law enforcement in the county and they have great concerns and um, some have very deep reservations. Um, I would suggest if there's time maybe next month to invite Lieutenant Tracy McCray of the SFPD on, he is suggesting that we fight this initiative because it's been a disaster in San Francisco. They have so many other problems. She has an interesting personal story, she came from the Bayview District and is now a leader in SFPD, fantastic lady. So I suggest speaking to her. Um, Foster City, I'll give you one example. They're down, most agencies from what I hear are down about 25, 30% and they can't find good officers. They're having a really hard time recruiting. Morale is down when you're talking to rank and file officers and there are deep concerns many residents about public safety. So far, so good. We're, we're not San Francisco County. We're doing really well. Our officers do a great job. Our deputies do a great job. But morale is not good right now. And the feedback we are getting from officers about fixing, uh, they are really concerned about it. So those are my comments. And thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, Clara Jackal, go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Um, I wanted to say um, and identify myself. I'm a member of at the city level of the Redwood City Police Advisory Committee. And to be clear, I'm not here to speak for or represent the committee, but speaking out of my personal experience as a member and where I have the pleasure of also serving with um, Commissioner Enriquez, who's also on that committee. Um, I would say it's been a really positive experience. It's been a good avenue of communication with the Redwood City Police Department. And I think we've been able both to bring to light community concerns and to um, to understand more about what the police department does. And so I think it's been a, a very positive relationship and I would really love to see that implemented at the county level as well. Thank you. Thank you, Clara. Um, Mark, I don't want to pronounce your last name wrong. Ruan. <laughs> Close ahead. enough. Yeah. Um, so uh, Jim's, Jim was breaking up a little bit in his talk, but I, I believe he mentioned something about bail recommendations. And maybe I didn't hear that correctly, but if you could perhaps clarify what, what he meant about a, um, an oversight board having to anything to do with the bail recommendation, I, I'd appreciate some clarity on that. No, Mike, you misheard. Uh, the oversight board has nothing to do with bail recommendations. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you didn't say anything about that. Okay. No, no. Thank you. All right, Rachel, go ahead. Hello, thank you for having me. Um, so I do have some major concerns and you might have addressed these before I was able to get on the meeting, but how do we keep politics out of this? Like, how are they um, choosing the board members, number one? And number two, is, is there going to be uh, law enforcement representation on this as well, because I think to be an outside person who's never done the stressful job of policing before uh, doesn't know what the day to day um, stressors and dangers are. And so can you answer those two for me? Nancy, the, excuse me, Rachel, the board of supervisors has sole authority to pick all 11 members of the oversight board, as well as to hire the inspector general. So they believe that they are honorable gentlemen and they will pick the right parties to serve. If they but, deem that a, a, a police officer or a person with law enforcement experience uh, is an asset to that committee, I believe they will make that decision. But I can't speak for the board, but they no, do I, have the authority. I, I understand that. And while I, I do respect that belief is one is, is one idea, that's not going to be uh, a for sure. And so how do we make sure that they don't go after our police? What if we, what if they pick everybody that is completely for defunding the police or does not like police or has a run in with the police where they, they think that uh, the police are biased? Like, how do we keep it neutral so that it just seems like belief is not exactly a great answer on that? Rachel, thank you um, for your concern. And um, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut off public comment, but just, just to be clear, this is an opportunity for the public to make comment on the proposal, but, um, but, the, but not to have a debate with the commissioners about it. So thank you for your comments. And, right. um, and I, I, I'd like to recognize Tom Quick. Thank you very much. 
Uh, I'm new to this process. I picked up on it because of my involvement with San Bruno Neighborhood Watch Program. I happen to be a block captain and getting heavily involved in seeing all sorts of criminal activity going on in the community. And we're continuing to grow that. Uh, one of my questions I have is, uh, and getting new to this is uh, from everything I've read, is how is this whole process funded? Not too sure about that. But from what I've heard so far in the discussion and everything I've read, I think there needs to be more studies done and more input from other um, uh, counties that have tried it or might be uh, in, in the process of uh, using it and struggling through it. And uh, I think it needs to be tabled at this time to get more information and presentations next month, as Catherine mentioned earlier. Um, especially for the for the funding of it, uh, I have, haven't had a chance to it uh, to clearly understand how this whole, whole um, process is funded, and and fixing SMC group itself uh, is this to a totally um, process that's controlled by the county and there's no outside influence of a organization coming in from outside the county to sit on the board um, and have its influence uh, subjected uh, on the decisions that the county wants to make. So um, like I said, new to the process, um, I usually get up to speed pretty quick on this. So uh, from everything I read, I would say, no, let's not have any vote on it right now. Let's get more information and, uh, and then have good discussions and make sure we hire the correct people and the correct mix to have full transparency and so that there's good conversations and real good oversight because yes, the criminal justice system needs to be properly enforced. So there is no heavy handedness, but at the same time, those that really need the help Let's get them the help they need so they stay out of the system. Thank you, Mr. Click. I appreciate your comments. And um, I just want to remind commissioners that um, we do have a motion on the, on the floor that's been seconded to send the letter uh, that is in the agenda packet um, to the Board of Supervisors, asking them to use the authority the state legislature has given them to create a civilian oversight uh, board and inspector general for the sheriff's office. That's the motion on the floor. And having heard public comment, um, uh, commissioners, are there any other, is there any other debate or discussion or uh, should we move to a vote? Uh, Commissioner Swope. I would like us to move to a vote. We're not the body to make a decision to, to go into this, to study this further. Uh, that's for the board of supervisors to do, I think. Right. The motion on the floor is is to is to recommend to the board um, that they that they do create this uh, civilian oversight uh, board, but it is up to them how that's done and who they pick and so forth, and whether they want to study it more. Uh, all right. Having hearing no more um, questions or discussion from our commissioners, uh, I'd like to call for a vote. So let's do a, um, a roll call vote on the motion. Uh, uh, again, like I said, the motion is to send the letter that is in the agenda packet to the, to the Board of Supervisors to recommend um, that, they, that they create the Civilian Oversight Board and Inspector General. Uh, Commissioner Huber Levy. Would you like to do the honors of the roll call? Roll call vote, yes, I would. Um, so Chair Lebuis. Uh Aye, in favor. In favor. Um, I also vote in favor. Uh, Commissioner Enriquez. Aye. Commissioner Bocanegra. Yes. Commissioner Liu. Uh, I'll have the... Okay, uh, Commissioner Nori, uh, Amea Nori. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Satvik Nori. Yes. Commissioner Rasmussen. Absolutely yes. Commissioner Swope. Yes. Uh, and Commissioner Wilson. Yes. 
So that is um, eyes and one abstention. Okay, great. The motion passes. Uh, the motion to send the, the letter that's in the agenda packet to the Board of Supervisors. So thank you everyone for the debate and discussion and all the questions and to Fix and San Mateo for your presentation. Um, the motion passes. We will move on now to uh, agenda item five. Uh, we have a few items of um, commission administrative business. Uh, the first is a, uh, a membership update. Uh, Commissioner Enriquez, our vice chair of membership. Um, I, if you have any membership updates, uh, please go ahead. Um, I do have one about our uh, commissioners elect if you don't have, any, have the latest information on that. Um, but go ahead, you go first, please. Yeah. Just to update that we currently have uh, 12 commissioners at the moment and our, we are we have uh, uh, three open make vacancies. So if you guys are interested in applying uh, to this commission, uh, please visit the website online. Um, we, if, I'm not sure for those who knew uh, Sasha, she's no longer with us. Um, is that the update you were gonna give Monroe? Well, I was just going to update on on the commissioners elect uh, Bustos and uh, and um, um, Mamadi Uhila. Yes, yes, got it. All right, you could you could do that part then. I think that if you guys are interested in uh, being part of this commission, just go ahead and apply to the apply in the website, and there's more of them information there. If you guys have questions, just feel free to email me too. That's all I have. Thanks. Yeah, um, we have uh, a, we have a max of fifteen commissioners um, currently. Actually, I think with the resignation last month of uh, Sasha Newton, who moved to Oakland, and so since she is not a resident of San Mateo County anymore, could not serve on the commission anymore. Um, we're down to eleven, but we have two commissioners elect, um, Alan Bustos and uh, Mamadi Uhila. And uh, the Board of Supervisors, I think, was on a bit of a, a recess in August, so they have not yet acted to, um, uh, to approve our recommendation to add uh, uh, Ms. Uhila and Mr. Bustos to the commission. So with them, we would be up to 13 and have two spots open. So I just wanted to let everyone know that, um, uh, that uh, the board has not yet acted on on those um, appointments. Has, no. the, has the court approved them? Uh, I did approve them, but as to the issue of the person with the issue with the 12 year, I, I left it up to the board, but subject to their approval, then the court would approve. Right, right. To remind, and we talked about this at a previous meeting, um, Mamadi Uhila has served previously on the commission. And I, I also sent a letter to the board requesting that they grant an exception and, and, and let her um, serve again. Okay, any other questions about membership from commissioners? Thank you, Judge Atizadi. Yes, we have two seats open. <laughs> welcome. I, I just had a, uh, a quick question. Yes. Do mm -hmm. we have any um, pending applications, Commissioner Enriquez? Did we have a couple of applications that were? Um, I did receive uh, two of them, but um, I did not forward them to the interview committee for cer certain reasons. They did not oh, okay. our, our target demographics. So uh, okay. they were forwarded to you guys. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, let's move on to uh, item 5B. Uh, and that is um, an item that I added to the agenda. So I will uh, give the report on that. Um, it, it is a proposal for uh, stipends for commissioners. Uh, this is something that has come up in the past. Um, and so I wanted to, to address it. The Welfare and Institutions Code that created the uh, that that created the, our commission also does say 
um, that the county shall reimburse commissioners for their expenses related to serving on the commission. Um, and, uh, or there's an alternative, which is that instead of commissioners needing to submit expenses and uh, in order to figure out which expenses apply and, and not, that uh, the board may, the, sorry, the board of supervisors may also uh, pay commissioners a $25 stipend um, for each meeting, uh, not to exceed two meetings per month. So that is what the, um, that is what the Welfare and Institutions Code says uh, about helping to cover expenses like parking and gas and that sort of thing for, um, for commissioners serving on the commission. And, uh, and so that gives us two alternatives. We can either figure out the process and uh, there would be a process that we've got to sort out with the, with the county for submitting actual expenses. Um, and again, just to be clear, these are expenses for attending the meetings. Uh, or we could ask the Board of Supervisors to just pay $25 stipend for each meeting to each commissioner. Uh, so that is my report on, on this. And um, if there are, any, are there any questions from commissioners uh, on this topic? Commissioner Rasmussen. I would just like to recommend that um, we, uh, we not make it an automatic stipend because some folks receive benefits, may it be social security or some type of benefits that um, they're not allowed to accept things like stipend. So if we made it automatic, it may exclude people. And we don't, I don't, I think it may be an unintended consequence. So um, I just wanted to put that out there. Okay, Commissioner Nori. Um, I would just say that I actually favor the stipend model because I do think that a lot of times some of these ex expenses would be hard to really reimburse for and you know i don't know i feel like we do a lot of stuff for the kids that it's kind of more complicated so i'd favor the stipend model i think i think that's what a lot of other boards and commissions do around in san mateo county at least that i've seen so i think that would be a good thing for our commission to also have uh commissioner wilson I just wanted to share that from having done membership and working to recruit people from all different economic backgrounds, I really feel, especially for youth members or for people who don't have the luxury to donate as much time and money to this work, that it's important philosophically to have that as a remediation. Commissioner Huber Levy? Mute myself. Uh, I was wondering if there's an opportunity to have people opt out of the stipend so that would resolve that issue. So if someone had um, was receiving some other type of benefit that they could opt out of the stipend and not be precluded from participating. Um, also, I wondered if we do have the opportunity to still request a budget for other expenses or whether obtaining a stipend model precludes us from also requesting, for instance, to attend training at the annual conference that we had talked about. Yeah, and just to, just to answer your questions, since I you know, did the, looked into it in the Welfare and Institutions Code, um, uh, the stipend is a, for, for first of all, the stipend is a separate thing. It's separate from budget or not budget. And, mm -hmm. and okay. you know, both, are, both are at the discretion of the Board of Supervisors. Um, you know, we really need to get their vote and support for it. Um, and uh, as far as uh, you know, someone opting out um, if it creates complications for them, um, the Welfare Institutions Code didn't specifically address that. But I would imagine that that since the intention of this is to reimburse for expenses uh, associated with meetings, um, that we could structure the proposal however we wanted to the Board of Supervisors um, to 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 address that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think given the, you know, certainly if there's more questions, then we can, we can take them, but um, this would be an appropriate time to make a motion if anyone wants to on this, uh, on this subject. Well, what are we making a motion to do? 
Well, why don't I, since I gave the report, why don't I make the motion? Normally I try not to, but uh, uh, I will try to, I will make the motion. Uh, I would make, I move that uh, the commission um, send a request to the board of supervisors to receive a stipend of $25 each uh, per meeting, not to exceed two per month per the welfare and institutions code. And we can include in that that there may be exceptions or opt outs, um, but it's not automatic $25 for everybody. Second. And so, yeah, my motion is to send that, making that proposal to the Board of Supervisors. And I heard a second from Commissioner Swope. Any more? And to my knowledge, Social Security doesn't uh, object to people getting money from other sources. If I got too much, they would reduce my, they would increase there's, my taxes. <laughs> yeah, there's, I, I, I am on disability and I have to file paperwork anytime I have income. So I would be somebody who would not. Might have that, right. Yeah, yeah. But that's, that's a great piece of information, Commissioner Rush. Thank you. Um, any other debate or discussion on this motion from commissioners? All right, uh, why don't we have a, um, I think we can do a voice vote on this. Uh, I will move for a vote on the motion to send a letter to the Board of Supervisors requesting a stipend. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? All right, sounds like the motion passes. And uh, and just to be clear, I did not put a draft of a letter in the agenda packet, but um, I I am going, I will send a simple letter, you know, uh, requesting that to the Board of Supervisors. All right, uh, second thing, sorry, third thing in our administrative business for the, uh, for the commission uh, was, um, discussion on and a proposal on our future meeting locations. Uh, I added this to the agenda um, because our um, experience of all getting together in person at our retreat on August 20th, I think was, I think I, think I speak for the group in saying uh, we really enjoyed that. Uh, and also, and also uh, this was the first time that I can recall um, going to a commission meeting where we held it in um, in a community location at a community center at a place where uh, we could welcome the community in and uh, and hear their input and uh, and that was really great. Um, it is also great to um, to have Zoom and uh, it really allows a lot of people to participate and over the course of the last year or two, the number of people that we have coming to commission meetings has really gone up, uh, which is also um, a terrific thing. So I just, I wanted to suggest that, uh, that the commission start planning and holding meetings in person in community locations, but that we also use something uh, that's known as an owl, um, which, it turns out Commissioner Rasmussen has one, um, but I've, I've seen this used in schools as well that essentially enables an in-person meeting to also broadcast on Zoom and um, the owl can hear who's talking and spin and, and point a camera at them. So essentially I'd like technicalities to be sorted out later, but, the, but my proposal is that we, we start planning meetings in community locations meet in person, but also accommodate Zoom for participants uh, because that has really been a positive thing for the commission. Um, and that's my suggestion. I guess I'm not making a motion yet, but uh, any, any questions or discussion about that with commissioners? Commissioner Nori, I see your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to really stress the part that it's not mutually exclusive. Like I do think, cause I think I'm one of the few commissioners 
who remembers when we used to have in-person meetings. And I do think there's some, there's more of a collaborative spirit when we're all in the same room. And, you know, it's, yeah, I think it's easier to like stay on the same page and build a sense of community, but that isn't mutually exclusive, you know, letting people participate on Zoom. And I think that's what the resolution allows us to do. And I know a lot of other commissions, especially school boards, like went back to meeting in person. And I think they did that for a reason, you know, I think it would be good for us to at least maybe start with being like gradually phase it in, like maybe start with every other month meeting in person, just see how it goes. But I do think it would be good for our commission to start meeting in person. Commissioner Liu. I think that we could also consider meeting in various places in the county, uh, starting with like EPA, North Fair Oaks, and then moving up to Daly City, possibly the coast, San Bruno, uh, to really represent all the diverse perspectives in our county. That's a great idea. Commissioner Swope. I'm just wondering if we start meeting in person, does that mean that we couldn't invoke AB 361 anymore so that we could have uh, Zoom only meetings if we needed to? Uh, I, I don't know if we need to ask our council no. about that. I know what the school board does and they still invoke it every single month, even though like they meet in person. So I don't think there's anything in AB that prevents you from me still meeting in person. But I think what it does allow is if a, a commissioner can still come on Zoom too. So the, before I think all the commissioners would have to be in person, you could still live stream the meeting. But if we invoke that, a commissioner could also join on Zoom even if the rest of us are meeting in person. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Rasmussen. I would be in support of a hybrid model for sure. Um, you know, I'm one of the commissioners that still has young children at home. And so um, that would be a hybrid model would be great. And I know that the city councils do that as well. If there's someone that can't be there in person for whatever reason, um, it's sort of hybrid, you know, for, um, you know, so, so there's options for everyone to participate under even unusual circumstances. Yep. Commissioner Bocanegra? Yeah, I think that the hybrid model would be um, advantageous for someone like myself, system impacted. I work out of, I work in Oakland. I, I can't find a job here. No, nope, can't pass a background check. So I have to leave work about an hour early to make it here uh, today. And I made it 15 minutes early, by the way. I just want to put that on the record. <laughs> Hold um, on. Yeah, it, 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 it's uh, more convenient. However, if, if we move in, in person, again, as always, uh, I'm more than willing to sacrifice for these youngsters who are uh, trapped in this pipeline. So thank you. Yep. Any other questions or uh, discussion on this? Uh, I, guess, uh, I just, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. I go just ahead. wanted to quickly say that I think, I know like the governor like extended it, but from what I read, I don't think like this AB thing, I think it does sunset in a couple of years. So it might also be good. Cause I, I mean, I would doubt that they're gonna like, they probably might not extend this option in the future for us. So I think it might probably is good to start getting now so we can like, you know, ramp up. Yeah. Yeah, and I will, um, I will clarify that, um, well, because there are some technical issues to work through, you know, with how to do the hybrid model. And also I can see that there are also, we would need a plan for how do we choose what location, you know, how much, uh, how much input do we get from commissioners so that we can, you know, agree on a spot that's convenient for everyone um, if we do move it around, right? Uh, we need a bit of a plan on this. So mm -hmm. um, I think what I would, suggest is that um and maybe again since i put this one on I, I i will make a motion that that we form a small subcommittee to come up with a plan that we present at our at our next meeting on on how we do this uh and and some ideas for you know locations second hey. uh commissioner hubert levy i see you have a question or a comment my comment is just that I am supportive of, of having a hybrid model to have flexibility. And I, I do echo the sentiment that it was a very positive experience to be together and um, communicate in a much broader way, I think, by being present. Um, and I wonder if we could just reach out to some of our key stakeholders, too, to see 
to ensure that we don't lose their input and to make sure that we make it convenient and accessible for everyone because it's been a wonderful experience to have as many people from the community and the partners that we work with being part of our meetings. Right. Commissioner Wilson. I just, I would want to make sure that we had an understanding within our commission expectations because um, it would be a real bummer if there was like one commissioner who decided to phone it in, you know, like an ongoing basis, <laughs> yeah. um, rather than because of real need. I can just, I'm just putting it in our minds that we need to think about how accountability works sure. if we're going that way. Okay. Any other, any other questions or debate from commissioners um, on this topic? Are there any uh, members of the public that that want to make comment on this idea? Uh, I'm sure we could learn from you and get in your input. Okay, well, um, I think we've talked about it thoroughly. So again, the motion on the floor is, is to form a, uh, a subcommittee to come back next month with a more specific proposal and ideas for how we go about holding meetings in person, sometimes in community locations uh, and hybrid so that people can still participate by Zoom. Best of all, best of all worlds, I guess. Uh, that is the motion. Um, let's, let's do a voice vote on this uh, first and see uh, if there's significant objection. Uh, all commissioners in favor, please come off mute and say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the motion passes unanimously and I will follow up. I'll take the action to follow up uh, with commissioners to um, pull this subcommittee together. Okay, moving on to item six on the agenda, uh, a proposal for a JJDPC annual award. Um, this idea came from Commissioner Rasmussen <laughs> who has shared her screen and, uh, and ready to present. So take it away, Commissioner Rasmussen. I think you might be on. Yes, thank you so much. So um, basically uh, what this proposal is, is to create an annual award to recognize an individual or individuals who've made an extraordinary difference in the lives of system impacted youth and families in San Mateo County. Now, there are several uh, commissions that are currently offering awards programs. Uh, for instance, the Veterans Commission gives out three annual awards. The Behavior Health Commission gives out three. The uh, Commission on the Status of Women gives out two. And they fluctuate on what they're about. Some of the awards are just given at a... Uh, you know, at one meeting each year. Some uh, are bigger events that are uh, luncheons. Um, some can even be used as a fundraising opportunity, you know, or a way to raise awareness um, about the commission and their work. So um, I put a proposal that was included in the, um, in our agenda packet, and it talks about the types of awards um, that are given out by the different commissions, their names. And what I would be asking uh, the commission for is to form a subcommittee uh, to, to gather uh, information and come up with um, potential award name, the purpose, nomination criteria, the nomination forms, the design of the award, presentation options, and uh, potential recipients. And once we were to um, gather all of that information, we'd bring it back to the commission for a vote. And um, yeah, so that's basically uh, what this is about. I think that this is a wonderful way to recognize leaders and heroes in our community, and also a great way to let the community know about the work that we do and, and who we do the work for. So does anyone have any 
questions. So um, I had a quick question. So when you say system impacted, are we, um, like, does, would that also include, you know, people who work with like foster youth or are we limiting it to the kids in the hall? When I use it, be, because we don't have um, like a mandate over uh, foster youth, but they, there's sort of some crossover. So I guess that would be something that the subcommittee would vet out. Um, I, I use the term system impacted. So we're making sure to capture, you know, kids who might be on probation, kids who, you know, may have been incarcerated um, just to, as, a, as a net to sort of, oops, to gather um, as many folks as possible. But these are all like the minute details are not set out. It, it would be sort of a collective process to figure out what does everybody think and what would they like to see? And um, so, well, yes. I like, I like the idea. I, I would like us to include people who've done really impressive work in delinquency prevention, as well as work that help uh, young people get out of the system. So. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And and I was uh, remiss for not including that language, but everything that comes under the purview of the commission. Thank you so much, Susan. And yes. we, gave, we gave an award once, which was an attempt to get this going. So I'm glad that you are taking this on and I, I fully support you. Thank you, Susan, I appreciate that. Hi, I, I do also support the um, idea of an award and the uh, motivation behind it and the recognition for those in our community who are working hard for the youth that we care about. My only concern is what we have on our plate right now. And I was just yeah. looking over the 2022 projects and statuses and the projects not started. And I'm wondering whether we could um, consider this as part of the next round of projects in terms of not diluting our focus for what we've got on our plates right now. And I'm, I'm just thinking of things that we've committed to in the near term and um, wanting to accomplish those things through November. So we have a lot on our plates and adding another subcommittee may, may be a drain on the commissioners who are already quite busy. So that's my only caution. Yeah. If we could just maybe consider it with our next round of obligations as we plan the next year. I have the same concern, although I have no objection to it, except for that we are always so busy and our agendas are always so packed. Commissioner Lou. All right, uh, I, I love the idea of a scholarship or some sort of award, but I was just wondering if we have the budget or if we need to get the budget for that. So just to be clear, so it wouldn't be a, a monetary award, it would be a recognition. So it would strictly be a recognition, it wouldn't be a monetary award. And this would be an ongoing thing. So I don't know that it would necessarily qualify as a project only because every year then we would have, you know, we would come up with the nominations like that. This is just getting it off the ground. So it would be an ongoing uh, thing. It, it may even be, maybe fall more under like a, a liaison type or a, it wouldn't necessarily be a project because I believe if I'm correct that our projects like have like an end date or, or end somewhere. And so this would be something that would stay with us just like it does with the other commissions and basically it once it's off the ground it, it's um the process is about a month out of the year that the subcommittee you know reviews nomination forms from the community and then gets together makes a recommendation and then the commission votes on it like that i see thank you for clarifying commissioner bocanegra yes one month out of a year uh, i believe for some of the work that uh, people have done here way before myself uh, and those who will, will probably continue be doing, continue this, to do this work after I'm gone, I think that uh, a month out of the year would be, would be reasonable and viable. I, I would sign up for this. Cool. Uh, 
I think there aren't any other comments from commissioners. I um, I would just add that uh, I think we're already making an effort to do outreach to the community and to get to know uh, members of the community that are doing this work. Uh, and um, and that this is one way to kind of further that um, connection with members of the community, uh, because I presume there will be, assume there will be some sort of maybe even like an interview process or a, th that's to be determined. I, I, I think the proposal is that the subcommittee come up with the, the process for how we do this, right? So, so um, if I'm not mistaken, I don't think there's actually a motion on the floor yet. So this would be a good time for a motion. Great, I'd like to make a motion to form a subcommittee to explore um, the options for creating an annual JJDPC award to uh, recognize um, individuals who've made an extraordinary difference in the lives of youth and families in San Mateo County, both in I'll delinquency second. prevention and in juvenile justice. I'll second. Thank you, Wesley. Uh, any other questions or comments before we move to a vote? All right. Um, Let's try a voice vote on this one as well. Uh, if we have any people that would like to uh, abstain or oppose, then maybe we can count it up afterwards. Uh, commissioners, all in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone, anyone opposed to forming this subcommittee to explore an award? Any abstentions? All right, the motion passes. Um, let's get that subcommittee formed. Um, Commissioner Rasmussen, um, let's touch base on that uh, afterwards. Okay, so moving on now to uh, the last agenda item, which is uh, updates from our subcommittees and from commissioners. We have about 20 minutes left uh, in the um, in the meeting. So this time, just a note on the agenda. Um, instead of listing individual projects uh, or updates, I put to kind of put things in order of, I think what is the priority uh, according to our operating policies. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I won't, let's hear about inspections and projects first, and then if there are any updates from coordinators or liaisons, we can uh, we can get to those. So, um, so first of all, uh, an update on inspections. I am going to call on Commissioner Rasmussen, and um, and Commissioner Rasmussen, if uh, if you want to ask anyone else to update on their individual inspections, that 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 seems like a good idea. But I'll leave it to you. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, and, and I'll be brief. So since we last met, we received a letter from the BSCC letting us know that they get, provided us a list of holding facilities, police departments that may potentially have held juveniles uh, since our last inspection period. Um, the list included some places even down in San Jose, so the list was not uh, very clear, but I am in the process now of confirming which departments uh, did detain uh, juveniles last year for any length of time. I have identified that Redwood City Police Department did indeed uh, do that. And so I'm thinking that this may be a wonderful opportunity for our youth commissioners to participate in the uh, police department holding facility inspection. So if any of our youth commissioners would like to join me in doing this, um, I welcome the opportunity uh, to show you the ropes and have you participate in that way. So the YSC inspection, I, I'm leading that and uh, the, the team on that is Sothvik, uh, excuse me, Commissioner Nori, Commissioner Boca Negra and myself. We went in for our first uh, in round of inspection. It was a two hour period last week and we will be going back tomorrow for a um, for longer period of time. Hopefully to wrap up, I received a, uh, report from Monroe that his um, his inspection, he's leading the Camp Kemp inspection, and that is in process. I received an update from Commissioner Nori. The educational inspection is scheduled for September 12th, and I received an update from Commissioner 
Huber Levy, who is leading up the Canyon Oaks inspection, and that is scheduled for September 7th. I also wanted to briefly add that I had an opportunity to meet with Supervisor Canapa. He wanted to go over our last year's inspection line by line, and we did that a couple months ago, and I um, unfortunately didn't have the opportunity to report that out. And in that conversation, going over the inspection report, this is where the opportunity for a budget, what came up in that conversation. And so I'm looking forward to meeting with Supervisor Canapa again. He's interested in going over these this year's inspections line by line as well. So I believe that is if anyone, any of our leaders for the um, inspections would like to share where you're at or have anything else to offer, um, I open up the floor and welcome you to do that. I'll just add that um, this is our August meeting. That means that we have uh, only three meetings left in the year, uh, September, October, November. We don't have a meeting in December. Um, and so and so it normally, uh, we try to get drafts of inspection reports done for the October meeting so that if there are any questions or changes or anything like that, then we can finalize it for the November meeting because inspection reports do need to be um, voted on by the commission and approved. So I would just encourage everyone that's working on inspections to try to schedule. It sounds like things are being scheduled for this for September, but to, to aim for the October meeting for a at least a draft uh, of your inspection report. Great. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Rasmussen. Um, let's keep moving. Uh, are there any uh, people working on our various projects? And uh, I think that Commissioner Huber Levy referred to it, but I believe I put a list of our current projects in, um, in the agenda packet, as well as a list of our coordinators and liaisons. Um, but uh, Certainly not a requirement, but if there are any changes or updates to current projects like uh, PeerPoint, et cetera, um, um, this is a time to give an update. Raise your hand if you have any updates on your projects. Commissioner Bocanegra. I just wanted to update that I just got a I just got a notification from the S Senate Bill 1008 free phone calls for all prisoners. This would really uh, affect our youth who have been transferred or who are already in the adult system uh, to be able to communicate with their family, uh, their families affirmatively. Uh, so that just passed the assembly today. And I just wanted to ask everyone to continue to support SB 1008 and um, hopefully it passes the Senate, but it looks like it will. Good news, thank you, Commissioner Bocanegra. Any other updates on projects from commissioners? Okay, let's move on to um, updates from our coordinators, um, uh, legislative coordinator, marketing and social media, coordinator, uh, we've already had an update on inspections. Um, Johanna or Karen, uh, I guess Paul just gave an update on legislation, but uh, Johanna, did you have any updates on, on uh, marketing and social media? Yeah, so we are about to hit 200 on our Twitter account and we are up 63% on our reach on our Instagram account. So things are moving along our most popular post this last month was of our retreat. And it, for those of you who were there, you'll realize that I did some really creative photography work with the black and white to change those pictures around to get some, some more than one photograph on, online. But people really enjoyed seeing that. So the, the program is built, it is um, moving forward, but I am looking to our new commissioners, if anyone is interested in taking it over, if anyone is interested in in um, you know, working on it with me, um, I am happy to uh, bring you on board. So keep that in mind. Just to be clear, you're talking about social media specifically there? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. 
Any other uh, updates from coordinators? Okay. Um, uh, in addition to our um, coordinators, we also have uh, liaisons to the court, to probation, to uh, local police. Um, any updates from our liaisons? I have a update um, on uh, for law enforcement, law enforcement liaison. Sure. Um, so back on uh, uh, July 27th, uh, the Pol Pacifica Police Department arrested a 11-year-old uh, child uh, for starting a fire. Many of you may have read about it in the newspaper. And yeah. that was alarming to me because, um, you know, we passed SB uh, 439 that basically says that you know, children under 12, you know, are really not prosecuted in juvenile court. So I reached out to the police chief there to find out sort of what the circumstances were and what the purpose of the arrest was, just to get a better understanding of, of why this would be happening. And he was out on vacation, but I had an opportunity to meet with my very good friend, Mary, Mary Beer, who happens to be the mayor of Pacifica. And, um, we talked in depth with the assistant city manager and I have, I'm in the process of scheduling a meeting with the chief. He did provide me some answers as to uh, what uh, the thought was on, on doing so. They also worked with Rebecca Baum on this. And it looks like this was an opportunity for some additional training for the officers. And so um, I will report back next month on the outcome of the meeting with the chief. Um, but I think it's important for us to be mindful. If you, if you read about something in the newspaper, if you hear about something going on, this is what the purpose of the liaison is, is to be a, a di direct connection to the streets, mm. to the police departments. And, and um, so please continue to um, keep your eye out for that. And um, I will report back on more specifics um, after my, my meeting uh, later this month. Thank you. I'm on mute. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Rasmussen. Any other, any other updates from uh, liaisons? All right, we have um, we have about eight minutes left, and uh, looks like we we'll have some time um, if there are uh, announcements or. Uh, you know, updates from meetings that commissioners might have attended as uh, ambassadors of the commission to uh, other organizations in the county. Any other, um, anything else that would be informative that would be uh, useful to know? Uh, Commissioner Swope. Well, um, I've been appointed to the civil grand jury for the coming year, so I may have to resign from the commission that hasn't been made clear yet. I've talked to the four person and they are going to consult with county council and let me know what I need to do. Uh, the other thing is um, on September 12th, I'm getting my right shoulder replaced, which I'm really, really looking forward to. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, so. I detect a hint of sarcasm in your voice. <laughs> you can. <laughs> So I have no idea how that's going to affect me, but I think you can figure that I probably will be out of it at least for a week. And I have no idea what, what the effect will be on for, you know, I'll keep you posted. Could you, oh, go could, ahead. You, uh, could you please reach out? We'd be happy to help in any way we can as you're going through that. Please reach out, we're here to help. Um, you through that through that um, surgery in, in any way that we can. Thank you. Absolutely, Susan. Yeah, let us know if we can help. And Susan, uh, uh, likewise, um, we wish you the best of luck with that surgery. Uh, we will not expect you at the next meeting. Uh, <laughs> and if the um, if county council comes back and says you you can't serve on both the grand jury and the commission at the same time, which we know is possible then uh, we will certainly have you back anyway uh, <laughs> for a proper send off um, at the right time. <laughs> Thank you for that update. 
Uh, Commissioner Enriquez. Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so some of you guys know that I'm also part of the Redwood City Police Advisory Committee. Um, and just wanted to share, I already wrote in in the chat about the town hall that we're having on October 12th. Um, and uh, we're hoping to invite uh, community members from Redwood City um, that would like to just share, um, you know, about safety in their communities. Um, and just to update you guys on a ACE plan that Redwood City community-based organizations, they're having, they put together this plan uh, uh, due to this uh, bike life movement that was happening downtown Redwood City, where several of the youth were also arrested because of weapons and um, and business owners getting mad because they're trying to have fun and, you know, it goes from there. <laughs> And I'm not trying to get into that rabbit hole, so I'm just trying to stick to the agenda here. Um, but yes, the ACE plan, so just know that you guys are invited uh, to this town hall, and the meetings are also online if you guys want to check it out. Um, I just wanted to share that there's a lot of good work also happening in the city of Redwood City with a lot of organizations trying to support the youth and trying to keep them occupied with programming. programming. Um, so that's something that I'm also, um, you know, working on uh, being part of the, the police advisory committee. Um, so yeah, that's all. Thanks. Thank you, Roxana. Uh, Paul, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to share that. And I, I attended the North Fair Oaks uh, festival that they had. And I, I met up with uh, Roxana was there. Um, uh, Commissioner Rasmussen was there. Sadvik, uh, Commissioner Sadvik was there. And like um, Roxana just mentioned, I, I attended that um, police advisory um, committee meeting and heard uh, many labels and titles being unfairly placed on a lot of these youth. And at this North Fair Oaks uh, event, I, I, you know, I, I wear many hats in the community, so I'm constantly poking my head. Um, into different pockets of the community. And something I noticed alongside of my commissioners was right now we're having our youth being arrested downtown for the bike life movement, slowing down traffic, harassing people. And at this North Fair Oaks event that was in a parking lot, crowded parking lot, um, many women and children attending after church. Uh, I was there with my family, my wife, uh, watching these, deputies on their mountain bikes riding through the crowds, women and children having to get out of their way, um, was just absolutely disturbing to me that that we have kids right now in cages in juvenile hall or were in cages in juvenile hall for this very behavior. And at this event where uh, we attended after church, uh, we went out there to have a meal and spend time with our community. Uh, we encountered this very behavior by the very people that are arresting our children. So I just would like to ask the commission to be vigilant of, of these type of behaviors and, and report back here on, on the record, for the record, right? So that uh, community leaders become more aware of, of the double standard that exists when it comes to underserved kids, as well as uh, law enforcement behavior, when there's similarities on the spectrum and one is being punished and the other is being uh, paid over $100,000 a year. I think that we have to just call call that type of behavior for what it is and um, do more to advocate for our youth. So I just want to report on that. Thank you. Commissioner Rasmussen. Really quick, I forgot to include in my um, earlier police liaison report, but I also attended the Fair Oaks Festival, as Paul mentioned, and um, they, uh, the Redwood City Police Department, I don't know if you can see this, they are offering uh, gun locks, free gun locks. So um, I inquired about using these at any potential events that we have going forward, and they are on board to provide us with as many uh, gun locks as possible. I know uh, guns, uh, there's an uptick right now, and so anything that the commission can do to support our gun prevention efforts would be great. And then um, I wanted to also mention that I had an opportunity to speak with the Assemblywoman Bonta's staff today regarding Assembly Bill 2361, and the governor is expected to sign it by the end of the week. So for those of us who've been working on the resolution and on this 
these, uh, this particular issue, um, it's, it's a good day in California. So I'm, I'm excited to share that news. Johanna, could you remind us what is what is AB 2361? So what that does is it basically it changes the criteria for, um, basically it, it um, establishes some new criteria that must be met in order to send a, uh, a youth over to um, adult court. And right. so I'm probably botching that. I'm sure Judge Edizadi knows much more about it than I do, but that's a lay, lay person's um, view of, of what that means. It just, it establishes new criteria. All right, well, I'm sure we can learn more about it uh, online. That's AB 2361, right? Yeah, okay, great. Um, we are at 7.15, right on time. That is uh, when our meeting was scheduled to adjourn. And I don't see any more hands up for, for updates or announcements from commissioners. So I would entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. I second that emotion. Okay, I'll make the motion to adjourn the meeting. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. aye. Anyone, aye. Anyone aye. opposed? Anyone want to stay? Okay, the oh. meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Good Thank night, you, everyone. everyone. Have a good night. Great work. Thank everyone. you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody.